So the plan for today is that we're going to learn a bunch of collections. We call them ADTs, abstract data types. I'll explain what that term means in a minute. But uh, this week is learning all about all the different collections that we have in our Stanford Collection Library. Homework two that goes out on Friday is going to be uh, using those libraries to solve different programming problems. And uh, you know, unfortunately, we only have two lectures this week to talk about this material. Uh, we had an important holiday on Monday. And so we lost a lecture. So I'm going to uh, go a little faster today through some of the content, but hopefully we'll catch up. Um, one course announcement I wanted to make is that uh, we have a form up about our exams. So um, you, know, you don't have to come to these lectures. I'm so glad that so many of you did come to class today. But your lecture attendance is not part of your grade. But I do need everyone to come to the exams on their scheduled dates and times unless you have an approved conflict, like an athletic event or something like this. So I'd like you to go to this forum, everybody, individually go to this forum and just submit whether you're able to come or whether you have a conflict so that we can make sure we know everybody's status. Uh, I want you to do that by a week from Friday. I'll remind you more times closer to that date. But anyway, that's up. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you're also going to have your section start this week. <coughs> have you guys gotten a message about what section that you're assigned to? No? Yes? Oh, wow. OK. Well, hey, you do have section this week. And somebody assigned you to a room, although maybe somehow you didn't get a message about it. Some of the sections are today, so you should go check and see. <laughs> uh, you should have received a message. What you should do is, if you don't have that information, if you go to the CS198 website, cs198.stanford.edu, that site has a login, and if you log in there, it should give you some information about what section that you're in, including the date and time and room, and who your section leader's name is. So if you're not able to find that information on that website, please contact me and the TAs uh, by our uh, email contact information on the web page, and we'll help you, OK? But please double check that today if you don't know that, because uh, some of you have a section later today, OK? All right, so anyway, like I said, we're going to learn about collections today. So let me open up my slides. <clears throat> and this all comes from chapter five of the textbook, if you want to read along. We talked about vectors a little bit last time. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on vectors, because I think every language has a collection like this. And so <laughs> you guys, I'm expecting, have seen something similar to this in your own previous programming experience. Like in Java, they have the array list. That's almost identical to what this thing is. Uh, in JavaScript, the, you have a, a, a array or a list structure that's basically the same. Most languages have this kind of structure, uh, an, a list of elements that have indexes that start with 0. And so you can declare a vector. You can add elements at different indexes. The vector sort of shrinks and grows to fit the elements that are inside of it. You can access the elements using square brackets. So we've talked about that already. Um, here are the methods. I've already shown you this. I'm not going to linger on this slide. One thing that we've seen with these kinds of structures is you can insert or remove elements from different points in the structure. And if you add things at the end, they're just appended. But if you add things at the start or in the middle, it shifts things over to make room. Similarly, if you delete something, it shifts everything over to make room. If you want to delete <coughs> something without shifting, like for example, if I don't want this 8 to be here anymore, but I want to leave that slot blank, there's not really a way to say that. I mean, I guess you could replace the 8 with like a 0 or something, but you know, you, you can't like delete the 8 and have nothing be there. There has to be some kind of value there, even if it was just called 0 or, or something like that. Uh, some of you have heard of a special value called null, but uh, uh, null is not an int, so you can't put null in this case. But anyway, one thing we're going to talk more about on Friday is the efficiency of some of these operations. And I mentioned this briefly last Friday, that you know, this shifting takes time. So like, if you delete the first element of the vector, it has to shift all the other ones over. And each element that you shift takes a certain amount of time to do. And so the bigger the vector is and the more elements you're shifting, the more time it takes to do an individual insertion or deletion. right? So sometimes that affects how you should write your code. You know, if possible, you'd like to mostly add things and remove things from the end of a vector rather than from the front. You can't always write your code that way, but you'd like to if you can. Okay. So, uh, do you have any questions about that? Does that kind of make sense about the uh, make sense about, about the, <laughs> 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 uh, 
no, now I'm doing it. No. Uh, about how the vector works, about how the shifting works. You can have nested collections. You can have collections of collections, such as a vector of vectors. So uh, here I have a vector of vectors of ints, and then I add three vectors to my vector of vectors. <laughs> and so I call the individual vectors rows, and then the overall thing I call BB. Uh, so it's a little bit like a grid, because you can access the elements in there using two square brackets. That looks a lot like accessing a grid, right? What would you say is the main difference of this versus a grid in terms of what it can or can't do? <coughs> Let's see. Yes? Yeah, a grid has to be rectangular. All the rows have to have the same number of columns. And this thing could be non-rectangular. This particular one, I guess you'd say, is more triangular. You could have rows of different lengths. So, you know, some pros and cons. I will say another difference that's more just, uh, you know, nitpicky is that the syntax, you know, you have to write more lines of code to declare this thing, initialize it. But yeah, I think your answer is the best one, that this one allows a non-rectangular shape. But I just wanted to make this overall point that you can have a collection inside of a collection. You could have a collection of collections. That's, that's allowed in C++, okay? All right, so I'm actually not gonna talk more about vectors just due to time, because we lost our Monday lecture, but I wanna talk about another collection called a linked list. Now, uh, I think it's gonna be hard for me to motivate why you would be interested in this collection, because it does exactly the same things that a vector does. It's a collection of elements that have indexes that start from zero. And you can insert things. You can add things to the front or the end or the middle. So in terms of like what you would do with it, what kind of problems you could solve with it, it's identical in that sense to a vector. It lets you do the same things. But the difference is, internally, the way that the list stores the data is different. With a vector, it has a big brick of memory, which is basically an array, where it stores all the elements that you have added. With a linked list, it actually makes these little objects called nodes that sort of connect or link to each other to form a chain. We're gonna talk a lot more about that later in the course. It'll be your favorite thing. It's called pointers, you'll love it. Ask your friends in your dorm if they love pointers and see what they say. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, it's got a different internal structure, how it stores the data. Now you don't have to worry about that very much for now, but that internal difference has some ramifications that might affect your code if you use this thing. So if you wanna insert or add something into this structure, you know, I just talked a minute ago about with a vector, when you insert something, you have to shift the elements over to make room. With this structure, you do not have to do that. If you decide that you wanna insert the value 42 at index three, you just find that spot in the list and you just link it in, you just attach it. Um, you know, there's lots of different analogies for a linked list. It's almost like uh, each little box is a person's phone, and the arrow to the next box is like you've got the next person's phone number in your phone or something. And so you sort of call, what if you wanted to tell everybody that there was going to be a, a party? Uh, you're all going to go to a role delete because it's lit? Is that how you say it? <laughs> um, so you have to call each other, because, you know, it's 2000 and not 2018. So you have to call people to tell them that there's a party, right? So the first person calls the second person, and they call the third person, and so on. If you want to introduce one more person into the, the social <laughs> circle, you could just have one of the people call them and then have them call the next person, and you, know, you don't need to uh, do any more work than that. So that's interesting. That means that this structure can do certain operations more efficiently than a vector can do. <coughs> but as a trade-off, this thing is slower at certain other operations. So like, for example, it uses more overall memory than a vector does, and it's not very good for um, you know, looking at the nodes in certain orders. Like if you wanna just jump around to random elements and just look at their values, this structure isn't very good for that because the way that it looks up values is it has to start at the beginning and sort of walk over until it finds a value. And so that takes time if you have a large list. So anyway, my point of showing you this structure, I don't think you need to use the linked list library very much in this course, but I wanted to talk about this idea that sometimes you can implement the similar structures with different internal storage and they have different pros and cons. 
So that idea of different ways of implementing the same operations is something we also call an abstract data type, uh, ADT for short. So an ADT basically just means a set of operations that you want to be able to perform. I want to be able to add and insert and remove and ask for the size and clear. You want these different methods basically. So any object that supports those methods, you could say that it implements that set of operations. It implements that abstract data type. So a vector and a linked list both support the same abstract set of operations. We might choose to call that set of operations the list operation. So that's interesting. And we're going to come back to this theme, this idea, a lot in this class. We're going to you know, see a structure. We're going <coughs> to use it. We're going to say, wow, that's really helpful. I like that. How does it work? Well, maybe we'll learn one or two or three different ways that it could work internally and see their pros and cons. Often having to do with efficiency trade-offs, memory usage trade-offs, that kind of stuff. Okay. So that's what an ADT is. Um, I want to show you some more collections that come with our libraries for a while. I, and I want to spend most of the rest of class talking about two structures called stacks and queues. So now these are interesting structures because they are not as powerful as vectors and linked lists are. They don't support very many operations. So I think as like a salesperson, I have a hard time selling you this product. Because you're going to say, I don't think I need this product. I already have vector. I'm fine. So the pitch is t tough for me, you know. But I guess the sales pitch is the following. It's like these structures don't do very many things, but the things that they do, they do them pretty well. They do them efficiently. And so sometimes, you know, we're going to see this with some other structures this week, that sometimes less uh, flexibility means more efficiency or more power in other ways. Okay? So what these structures really do, let's talk about the stack first. A stack is a collection. Conceptually, you think of it as elements being stacked up vertically on top of each other in a collection. And when you add things to a stack, you always add things to the top of it. So if you add values like 1, 2, 3, 4, you know, the 4 was the one you added the last, and so it's at the top of the stack. Now, if you want to look at the elements or, or remove elements or something like that, the stack only allows you to access the top of itself. I think in, in a lot of real world analogies, like the, the plates at a cafeteria, when you go to grab your plate or your tray to get your food, it's a stack of plates, and you don't usually reach in there and grab the tenth one, you just grab the top one, because it's hard to get in there and get the other one, right? Uh, so that's kind of the analogy here, is you always touch the top one, the top element of the collection, when you're adding or when you're removing. And um, we use different terminology when we talk about adding and removing from stacks. We say that when you're adding to a stack, you are pushing a new element onto it. And when you're removing an element from the top, we say that we're popping it off. There's also an operation <laughs> called peak, which means I'm going to look at what's on top of the stack, but I'm not going to remove it. I just want to see it, maybe look at its value and use it for something. And that's it. That's kind of like all this thing knows how to do. Uh, it has a few other methods, like um, there's a there's a stack class that you can import, include into your project, and it has those methods push, pop, and peak. It also has other methods like is empty or size. And I, I don't know if I, I don't think I listed it on the slide, but you can print out a stack to see out or something, and you can see what it looks like inside. But um, that's it. That's all it supports. Uh, these slides say 01. I'll talk about what that means on Friday. Basically, it's shorthand for these methods run really fast. Um, in terms of like, why would you want a structure that's so simple, that does so few things, when, when we've already got vectors and grids and things that are more powerful than this? Well, there's a lot of problems that basically work well with this style of data access. Like, if you're building a programming language, if you're going to write your own language or write a compiler for a language, a lot of times, that involves stack-like algorithms. Like if you're, if you're evaluating expressions, you know, x plus y times z, you often will push things and then pop them, and you use that structure to evaluate the expressions. Also, uh, if, you're, um, if you're running function calls in a program, you know, function A calls function B calls function C, the functions that get called, they actually make a stack of memory about each function. And when you return, it pops the last function off of that stack. So stacks appear a lot in computer science. Maybe my favorite use of a stack is the undo stack. When you have an app like Word Processor or whatever that has an undo feature, basically the way that that's almost always implemented is they have a stack of actions. Like you type some text, that's an action. Then you made it bold color or bold uh, font, that's an action. 
Then you change the alignment to center. That's an action. Now you say, uh-oh, I want to undo. So it goes to the last action, the one that's on the top, and it pops it off and it undoes that. And you say, oh, I don't like that full pawn either. I'm going to undo again. So it pops the last action off again. So I think undo as a stack is an example I like. So anyway, stacks appear a lot in computer science. Um, <laughs> These are the methods and operations that a stack supports. So here's a quick example. I make a stack and I push three values. The two string is a little confusing because we don't like to draw it as a vertical string because that would take too many lines, you know? So we draw it left to right where the left is the bottom and the right is the top because we just want it to fit on one line. But anyway, the stack looks like this as you add the elements to it. The, the last one added is on the top, on the far right there. When you pop things, it removes and returns the top value. So this first pop, it removes and returns the 17. Then I do peak, it returns without removing the current top element, which is negative three. And then here last I pop and the negative three comes off, but now it's actually been removed from the stack as well. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> so there's a couple things that students often try to do with stacks that don't work. So one simple thing that you can't do is to access the elements by indexes with the square brackets. That bracket operator does not work with stacks. That kind of loop, go from zero up to size, access element i, i++, plus plus, it doesn't compile. I mean, it's against the nature of a stack. The stack doesn't want you reaching under the bottom of the stack and looking at the arbitrary elements. It only wants you to look at the top one. So that kind of code doesn't work. So, what do you do? If you want to look at all the elements of the stack, what do you do? What do you think? Yes? Pop them off one by one and just look at them and keep doing that until there are no elements left. So a more common idiom is the following. While the stack is not empty, pop the top element or peek at it and do something with it, right? One side effect of doing that is that when you're done with the loop, you lost the contents of the stack, <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know? I don't know what the real world analogy would be if it's like you said, hey, how many plates do we have at the food court today? Well, one, <laughs> two, <laughs> you break the fuckers and then you're done. Well, we have 12. <laughs> we have 12, I mean zero, because I broke them. Um, I don't know. Anyway, the, you empty out the stack doing this. You have to be careful. Now, of course, you might say, well, wait, wait, wait. How about instead of popping them off, I'll just peek at them? Because peeking at them won't uh, remove them from the stack, right? So what if I just said, while not empty, peek? <laughs> it's a good idea <laughs> on the surface, but uh, of course, the stack will never become empty unless you're popping things out, right? So yeah, the loop doesn't finish without the popping. So we have this, this issue of like, how do I look at a stack without destroying the stack? Um, we'll talk about that, but that's an issue. So I wanted to show you some code that uses a stack, and I just wanted to kind of have you trace through it in your head or on paper or whatever and see if you can figure out the, the output. So take a look at that if you want to talk to your buddy for a minute, that's cool, and then I'll call somebody to help me answer it. Go ahead. if anybody wants to help me out. If you're not done yet, that's okay. I just got to kind of keep things moving. Um, somebody brave wants to tell me what to think the right answer? Yeah. D. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I forget. I didn't write down what the right answer is. Um, but I'm sure we can figure it out together. So we make an empty stack. Wait, here's what I'll do. I'm a visual person, right? Uh, so 
let's make a text box here. So we push a seven, and then on top of the seven, we push a 10, and then we peak, so the output of that is gonna be the seven, or the 10, right? Because it's a seven the second time, right? Okay. <laughs> so you know at the end of the quarter, they make you guys evaluate me? <laughs> One of the questions is gonna be like, how much do you think the instructor knows the course material? <laughs> I want you to not think about that moment right there when you answer that question. Um, so that, yeah, so it's a 10. So actually, just knowing that the output begins with 10 is gonna eliminate answers A and B already. You said D, so let's keep going. Uh, so we did peak, which prints the 10. Then we do pop, which also prints the 10, but it also removes the 10 from the stack, right? So now the stack is just a seven. Now we push a three and a five, so the three goes on and then a five goes on, right? And then we print the pop result, which is the five, but that removes the five. Now we ask for the size. The size should be two. So, right, I mean, I think it goes on from there, but I think I've got enough of a unique pref I think I've, I agree with you, I think you're right. So, the answer is D, thank you. So, yeah, I mean, basically, this is how a stack works. Uh, I didn't have any loops on this slide. A lot of times when you have slide, uh, uh, um, Stacks, you're gonna have like a while loop or something and maybe we'll hit that next in a second. So let's write some code together. I wanna use a stack to check whether the parentheses and brackets in a piece of code are bound. You know, your IDE, your software does this, right? Like if you, um, if you open the wrong number of curly braces or close the wrong order of braces, it'll give you an underline or an error message or whatever. So we could do kind of a very simplified version of that same process. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass you a string, this kind of ugly looking string that's supposed to represent a piece of code. And it looks all mushed together because I want it to fit on the slide, but you can imagine it had different line breaks or whatever, but you pass you a string of code and all you care about is the parentheses and the curly braces in the code, okay? And what I want you to do is look and see if they match properly. So curly braces matching properly means the following. If there's an opening parenthesis or brace, there needs to be a matching closing one somewhere else later in the code, right? And uh, the order in which they're open and closed should mirror. So like if you open a parenthesis and then you open a curly brace, you have to close the curly brace before you close the parenthesis, right? Otherwise the closings are out of order. So I want our code to check that. Anyway, the overall behavior of the function is it's supposed to return, if there's any problems, it should return the int of the character index at which the error occurs. And if there's no error, it should return negative one to indicate the string is fine. There's no error. Okay? So, this says it's a stack exercise. How does a stack help me solve this, do you think? What do you think? <laughs> okay, I think that's a really good idea. He said, um, when you see an opening parenthesis or an opening curly brace, maybe we could push those characters into a stack so that we remember them so we know we need to match them later. And then when we see a closing parenthesis, maybe we pop, you know, it sounds like pushing is opening and popping is closing. And I think that's a good general idea for an algorithm. So let me go to my Qt creator. If you want to try along, this is, this is zip files on the website or you can use the code step-by-step -step website. So I'm going to write in this stack uh, file here. Um, so I've got a main that tests with some different code and it says what I want the right answer to be. And then uh, I've got our function just empty, ready to fill in, okay? Oops, what, what happened there, sorry. Um, okay, so you said push the opening characters and so I, I think I can sort of get us started here. Um, for each character in the string, that means for each index, i from zero to the code length, the character c is uh, code bracket i. So I wanna look at character c. I think what you said was if c is an 
opening parenthesis, or C is an opening curly brace, you want me to put it in a stack. So I don't have a stack yet, so you want me to create a stack of what type? Like just store these characters here maybe? Stack of characters? Stack? Okay. Uh, let me double check if I've included the stack library I have. Okay. So you want me to do stack.push the character C. So then else you're, you're saying like if it's a closing one you want me to if it's a, if it's a um, closing parenthesis or it's a closing curly brace then what do you want me to do? Pop? You want me to do stack.pop? Seems like this kind of the idea. We're missing a little more. Can somebody help me write a little more code? Yeah. <coughs> So first peek, and what am I peeking for to see if it's an opening character? Well, but I think they're all going to be opening characters of some kind, right? I'm only going to push opening things that need matching later. So, oh, if it's the right kind. Okay, right. So, so let's say the stack stores a parenthesis, a curly, a curly, and a parenthesis. And then down here, if I happen to see, um, you know, a closing parenthesis or whatever, I want to check that this matches with the top of the stack here, right? So I think that's what you're saying. So, okay. Um, so maybe in that case, maybe I'll separate these for just a minute. Like that, because maybe I, maybe what I want to do is slightly different. So if it's a closing parenthesis, I want to say like if the stack.peak is an opening parenthesis, that's good, right? That means they match. So again, what the function is supposed to do is it's supposed to return the int of the index where there's a problem, right? And so maybe in this case it makes sense to write our code the slightly other way to say, well, if what's on the top of the stack isn't an opening parenthesis, that's a problem, right? So I should return that this is where the problem is. What do I do return here? Int i, this index of the string is bad. The character at this index doesn't match properly, right? So similarly, if you have a closing brace and it isn't an opening curly brace, that's also a problem. And I think in both cases, uh, you want to sort of pop, right? Like, I guess, I guess what you could do is you could say, if it is the right kind, then pop it off. But, you know, else it's bad, so I'll return I. So I guess I could do something similar, but this one down here uses that brace instead, right? Kind of, if they match, pop. If they don't match, return that this is a bad index, right? Um, okay, and then if we get down here, if you get all the way to the end of the string, there aren't any problems, so you should just return negative one. So maybe that's okay to put outside at the bottom of the loop there. Let's try it out. I've got some test cases. It's going to try to run, and it <laughs> it's crashed. I blame myself. I apologize. Um, so this one, this case says that it passed. It says there's a problem at index 14, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So that closing curly shouldn't be there because the opening parenthesis uh, matches, right? So it, that's, that seems like that's working for that case there. Uh, then it crashes. It says attempting to peek at an empty stack. So I don't know if I really said this earlier when I was describing the stack, but if you try to pop or peek and there's nothing in the stack, <coughs> it crashes your program. You can't do that. You have to check first. You have to avoid that by checking whether the stack is empty or not. Okay? Why do you think this code is crashing? Well, it might have to do with what the second test case is. So let me go look at the main and see. The main looks, the second test case is this one. So it looks like this part of the string is balanced. This part of the string is balanced, but then I get here. I think it's crashing right there. Do you understand why? It's a closing parenthesis, closing bracket. What is on our stack at that point? Nothing. Nothing, right? And it sees a closing brace. So let's go look what our code would do. If you see a closing brace, 
check if the peak is, is matching, right? So to understand that that test case, we, are have an empty, we have an empty stack at that moment. We're trying to peak it. So what's the fix? You have your hand up? Go ahead. Sure, if the stack size is greater than zero and it has something on top. Right, uh, I like to say if it's not empty, I think that looks cleaner, but this is, that would also work fine. So I like to say is empty if it's not empty and the top element matches. So maybe I'd also put that here. I realize that this is kind of redundant with this and we'll, we'll think about that in a second. But um, let's run it again. So now actually much more of the code is running properly. This one is passing and this one is passing. This one is failing. What's wrong with that third test? So there's the string right there. Our code is returning negative one. It says there's no problem. But my tester thinks that that's the wrong answer. Why is that wrong? What's unbalanced about the break? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great answer, thank you. Um, she said, I'll repeat, that uh, we're just checking for matching to make sure nobody matches incorrect order, right? That's good that we're checking that, but there's another thing we ought to be checking, like you said, which is that uh, everybody who gets opened has to be closed at the end at some point. And so this code that we've written so far doesn't check that. And I think what you said was a great way to fix that, which is at the end here, we finished looking at all the characters of the string, and so what should be true at this point, if the string is going to be valid, is that everybody who got open got closed, which means that if the string is good, what should be the contents of the stack here? If the string is good, stack should what? It should be empty. Everybody who got open should get popped back off. That's what you said. So basically here, I think what I should do is I should say, if the stack is empty, I'll return negative one because the string is a good string. Otherwise, it does have an error uh, the way that I think the problem spec wants us to handle this is um, if any braces are never closed, return the length of the string, indicating like the problem is at the end. So, you know, this is bad, so we'll return code.length, the length of the string. Okay? So, now we pass all the different test cases. So, hooray, we did it. So, anyway, I just wanted to code with stacks a little bit with you guys so we could kind of see how stacks work, see how they behave. Um, do you guys have any questions about the code that we wrote? About stacks in general? About life? About anything? In the back, in the red. Oh, is that you, Zach? What are you doing? You're my section leader. Why do you have a question? That second test, where you said it passed, but it wasn't balanced because there was a closed memory brace. Oh, wait. It's not balanced? Wait. Did I do something wrong? I'll run it again. You said this one. Oh. So, okay, you're right. I was going to move on, but there's still a bug. Good thing you came to class to correct me. So, this, this string is actually not balanced, right? Do you understand why? Because, like, this part's all fine, but then when we get here, this is a closing brace where there's nothing that we opened. Do you know what I mean? So, like, this is no good. So we shouldn't pass that. <clears throat> so what do you think? What's wrong? What should I, what should I do to fix it? Sorry, who said that? Raise your hand. I didn't, I didn't hear what you said. Did you have a comment? Yeah. Yeah, you just saying, isn't the pass fail just saying whether your code is successful or not? Like whether, you got the index right. Oh, I did get the index right? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so this is saying that the bug is on index 20, which I think is here. And so it's saying we passed because we correctly identified that it is a bad string at index 20. Okay, so actually, he's just wrong. Go away, Zach. <laughs> That's okay. No, you know, uh, 
you got to test the tester sometimes. You got to check to make sure the tests are right before you. You ne never trust me and my test code without uh, looking at it more carefully. Yeah, so I think we did handle that actually. If we see a closing brace and there's nothing on the stack, our code flags that as an error because that would hit this. It would say if I see a closing brace, if the stack is empty, it'll go down here and it'll say that index is the bad index. So I, th I think we're okay. Anyway, any other questions about about the stack code? Yeah. Um, yeah, the question was, if you pop the stack, it also does return the value, but I'm not storing it anywhere. If you don't store it, it just kind of discards it. But if I want to pop it off and save it and do something with it, I can say, like, you know, care top equals that, and I can do something with top. In this particular instance, what I did instead was I used it by peeking at it, and then I popped it. So, you know, you don't have to store what's returned from pop, but you can if you want to. <laughs> Okay, well, I want to cover queues. So stacks, the thing is, there's not a lot to them, but the, these basic operations that they support, push, pop, peek, is empty, it does all those things really quickly, really efficiently. So I talked about vectors and how they have to shift and that can take a while. There is no operation that you can call on a stack that will be slow on its own. So that's good. It only has a few operations. It does them really fast. So let's look at another structure called queues that are a little bit similar to stacks. A queue is like a line, a waiting list of people like at a, at a restaurant or, or a you know, lunch line or something like that where um, elements are added and they get put in line. And if you add another element, it's put in line behind the existing elements. And then if you want to remove something from the queue, you remove the element that's at the front of the line. So you add to the back of the structure and you remove from the front of the structure. Um, I mean, the way we draw the queue, I guess my hand motions were backwards, really, because the way we typically show it on the screen is that we have the front at the left and the back at the right. So if you add, it goes over here, and if you remove, it comes <coughs> over here. But these are the operations that a queue supports. You can add something, which is also called enqueuing. You can remove something, which is also called dequeuing. And you can peek, which is looking at the front element to see who would come out if you did a DQ operation. So as you can see, this really is a lot like the stack, right? The major difference is that the stack, the adding and the removing are both from the same side, the top. The queue, the adding is on one side and the removing is on the other side. So uh, it has that slight difference to it. Um, okay, so why would you want a queue? Well, there's lots of tasks in computer science where you would want something like this. Uh, an example I think of a lot is like um, if you have a printer and different people send jobs to the printer, the printer takes a while to print each job and so it has to queue up the jobs and it just handles the jobs in the order that they came in. There's lots and lots of things like this. You know, net network routers, they have a set of packets of data they want to transfer so they have to queue them up so they can send them all out one at a time. All kinds of examples. All the presents you order on Amazon, they get put into a queue of people boxing them up and so forth, right? Um, so this is a structure that's useful. Now, again, I think the sales pitch is hard because you say, wait, a list of things, a queue of things, isn't that just a vector? Like, why don't I just use a vector for this? So I ask you that question. Why don't I just use a vector? And if I want to enqueue somebody, I add them to the end of the vector. And when I want to dequeue somebody, I remove them from the start of the vector. Why don't I just do that? What do you think? What do you say? Kind of like you said before about Yeah, he said the shifting the speed. If it were a vector, if I were constantly removing people from the front, I'd have to shift everybody over, and that takes time for the vector to do that. So I guess I haven't said this explicitly, but the queue does not have to do that. The queue is built in such a way that when you want to enqueue or dequeue somebody, it could do it very quickly. So a vector is actually a bad choice for those kinds of tasks. A queue is better. So anyway, those are some of the places that you might want to queue in a program there. But let's look at the actual coding with queues. There is a library called the queue class. You import, uh, include queue.h, and it has those operations that I listed before. It has nq, it has dq, it has peak, it has is empty and size, and you can print out a queue if you want. So here's a quick example. You make a queue, you add some elements. I mean, this code is meant to look a little bit like the stack code from a couple of slides ago. You nq some elements, and then if you print out what happens when you dq, you'll get the front element, which is 42, the one that you added earliest. And if you peek, you'll get the person at the front of the line without removing them. 
Okay? So I talked before about how you don't access the elements of a stack with brackets and indexes. That also is true for queues. You cannot reach into the middle of the line and extract out an element and look at it. Uh, you know, I talk about how a queue is like a waiting line, like you're waiting in line for lunch. And then I always think of, uh, you know, I went to school at the University of Arizona and I was in line at McDonald's once. And then this big dude comes up and he just gets right in front of me in the line because I'm pretty close to the front. He just like jumps right in front of me and I'm like, hey man, who do you think you are? And he turns around and he goes, I'm Gilbert Arenas. I'm going to the NBA next year. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wow, Gilbert Arenas. Go ahead. You can totally cut in front of me. And I was like so excited and I was like, you guys, you guys the star of our basketball team cut in front of me in line. It was so cool. And my friends are like, wow, great. <laughs> but there's no Gilbert Arenas provision in the Stanford queue. You can't cut in. You have to go to the back of the line, Gilbert, just like everybody else. And I get to go first because I'm at the front of the line. Um, no jumping into the middle, no inserting in the middle, no removing from the middle. Always add at the end, remove from the front, no matter what. So if you want to look at the elements of the queue, to even just loop over them, you have to similarly do a different style than you do with a vector. The most common way is to say, while it's not empty, DQ the front person and do something with them. And again, you cannot just use peak because the queue will never become empty unless you're removing people from it. But you might find that restrictive and say, ah, oh, geez, I don't want to lose my people to look at them. But most of the times when you're using a queue, it's because you want to pluck people out and process them and then be done with them. That's the point. And so you don't need to keep the elements around necessarily. You know what I mean? In the places you actually want a queue, this doesn't end up being really that much of a problem. There are some cases we'll talk about where you want to save the size of the queue as a variable rather than looping until it's empty. One example would be if you want to print all the elements out but keep them in there, what you can do is pluck them out, print them, and then add them again, something like that. But anyway, sometimes you have to keep the size of the queue as a variable. Uh, to illustrate that, I want to jump to a question called mirror. There's other problems. If you want to practice more, there's some problems in the code step-by-step -step website. But this mirror problem is I'll give you a queue of strings, and I want you to modify the state of the queue so that when it's done, it contains the same strings in the same order, followed by those also those same strings again in reverse order. OK? That's what I want. So if you go to the um, Qt Creator project for today, I have a file called queues.cpp. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rename main from here so it doesn't run that one. And I'm going to open up my queue file here. Uh, yeah, OK. So what I want to do is I want to write this. Oops, wait, I have the code in here. Don't look at that. Darn. I have the answer in the file. Oh, and now it's gone. OK, so I'm passing in this queue by reference with the ampersand. That means if I modify it here, the main will see the changes, right? So we usually pass these things by reference. So I want to mirror the contents. Do you have any suggestions? How do we get started on this? Yes? OK, so you said to use a stack to help us. Yeah, a lot of times when you're doing a problem that involves a stack or a queue, a helpful structure to use is another stack or another queue. That can often help you to solve the problem. So you're saying I want to make a stack of strings called stack. And then what do you want me to do? You want me to move the contents of the queue into the stack? So like while the queue isn't empty, pull something out of there, string s equals q dot dq, and then add that into the, um, the stack, stack dot push s. If you like to mush things together in one line, you can take this, oops, what did I do? You can take this here and cut it and paste it like that. I don't know if that line is hard to read for you, but it's like dq something and push that dq object into the stack. I'll put it back to the two line version, but you can mush that together into one line. OK, so at the end of this code, the queue is going to have nothing in it, right? And the stack is going to have 
A comma B comma C with the C on the top, right? And my eventual goal is I want A, B, C, C, B, A. If I just take the contents of that stack and I put them all back into the queue, what will I get? Like if I do while the stack isn't empty, string S <coughs> equals stack dot pop. So here I am, I am using the return value for pop here. Um, and then I do Q dot in Q S. What's the net result of all that code right there? Yes? I think that sounds great. There's a couple things to unpack there. So you said you think what this code does is it produces this, the reverse of the original queue. Let's real quick verify that. I can just run this and it should, oops, <laughs> I don't have a main because I called it main queue there. Okay, so let me try it again. Um, so before ABC, after CBA. So what you said there was totally right. Okay, now you suggest a way to fix it. Now. Um, I'll do that in a second, but I want to do something else first, which is, you know, if I want the forwards version and the backwards version, I used to have the forwards version at the start, right? So what some students will do is they'll say, hey, I know, Q string backup equals Q, and then like down below, they'll sort of take backup and they'll add Q to that, and now they have the whole thing, and that sometimes is fine, but I think a more interesting challenge would be, could I solve it without introducing another auxiliary structure? And you've added a nice, way to do that, which would be as I'm pulling the elements out of the original queue to put them in the stack, I could simultaneously also put them back into the original queue. So then down here, I want the state to be that I have A, B, C, this is the front and the back here, and this is the bottom and the top here. So if I can get it to that state, then the second while loop will dump the C and then the B and then the A. So I, I think I'll have the desired outcome. So a naive way to achieve what I'm trying to get here would be to say, well, push S, but also Q dot in Q S as well. Put them back in line, right? There's a small problem with that, which you already said. I'll give you a second to look. Do you see the problem with this piece of code, which I know isn't what you told me to do, but you see that this doesn't quite work, right? What's wrong with this? Yeah? If I remove someone from the queue and then put them back in the queue, the queue is not shortening. So I'm never going to get empty. My loop will never finish. And you already spotted that. So say again, what's the fix for that? Um, so find the size of the queue in the beginning and then <coughs> Right, you said if there's three elements in the queue, I need to do this remove and add, remove and add, remove three times. Whatever number of people were in here, that's the number of times I need to do this. I, mean, I know we're about to be out of time. Size equals Q dot size, and then for I equals zero through size, do this. That many times, and now at the end of our program, ABC, CBA. Great job, so uh, I'll stop there. Check your section times. Go to your section this week. I'll see you guys Friday. Thank you.